Okay then, um, I'd already posted today, certainly wasn't planning on doing another video today, but Donovan Mitchell being traded to Cleveland, of all places, is something I couldn't wait on. We had to go and do another video, and so Donovan Mitchell has been traded to Cleveland in exchange for Lowry Markkinen, uh, Obaji, who the Cavs just drafted this year, Colin Sexton, three unprotected firsts, and two pick swaps. You guys can probably already tell based off the thumbnail how I feel, but we're gonna break down the whole trade. We're gonna talk about who won, who lost, and what it means for the future of each of these teams. And of course, we're gonna talk about the New York Knicks as well somewhere in here. We're gonna try and do this all in one take as well. So for Cleveland, for me, this is, it's an absolutely massive win for them because it's not just the value, which we'll get to in a second. It's not even honestly relevant what they gave up for Donovan Mitchell. The ability to bring in someone of Donovan Mitchell's caliber, who's already an all-star caliber guy, who is going into his prime, who they would not have been able to bring in in free agency and sign to a long-term deal. The value of that in and of itself is massive to a franchise like Cleveland. It's not like this is New York, this is LA, this is Miami trading for Donovan Mitchell. They don't get opportunities to bring in players of this caliber unless it is, as you can see with the rest of their roster, someone like Darius Garland or Evan Mobley who they drafted, or finding a player that the other teams really, really undervalued and they were able to bring in in a trade and then sign long-term, that guy being Jared Allen. They don't get the opportunity to bring in guys like this unless it's LeBron. And so bringing in someone that you don't have the opportunity to ever and that complements exactly what this roster needs, as we'll get to later, is a massive, massive deal for Cleveland and for a team that already going into the season, I think, was like a dark horse top four, top five seed in the Eastern Conference, even as their roster was constructed before today. And then when you look at the value that they gave up in exchange for Donovan Mitchell, they did a fantastic job in this trade. I won't sugarcoat it. I won't take any longer to say it. This is an amazing deal for Cleveland. So Colin Sexton didn't play for them last year, basically. He got hurt in the beginning of the year. The year before, when Cleveland was objectively bad as a basketball team, he scored a lot of points per game and was one of the uh, more surprising points per game leaders in the league the year before. And so there's maybe some value there to Utah. Uh, Markinen is a guy that lasted way into the restricted free agency process last year that Cleveland got later on in that process. Abaji, they just drafted, and then three unprotected firsts and two pick swaps. And to me, that reads as Abaji is a first because they just got him in the first round. So four firsts, two swaps, and then I honestly don't really care about the fact that they gave up Markkinen, who doesn't really fit with their roster, but was just kind of an asset, and Colin Sexton, who didn't play for them last year, and it's unclear whether he fits alongside of Darius Garland, who I would prioritize over Colin Sexton moving forward anyway. So when you look at what Cleveland actually gave up in terms of their real roster this upcoming season, it is four first-round picks, two pick swaps, and Lowry Markkinen. That, to me, is what mattered to the roster this upcoming season. It was unclear whether Colin Sexton was even going to return to them this season. And so to give up that in exchange for a player in Mitchell that is all-star caliber, going into his prime, signed long-term, that's exactly what they need on this roster, it is a 100 out of 100 for them in terms of a grade. Like, it is as good as you can do from a trade perspective if you're Cleveland. And what blows my mind, as we'll get to later, is that this was the deal, not only that Utah accepted, but that would obviously, in their opinion, was the best deal out there for Donovan Mitchell. That blows my mind. But what I would imagine most people are more interested in in this video, particularly, is Utah, what their mindset is here. So for them, they clearly went into this offseason when they decided – uh, to move on from the Ro the Rudy Gobert, Donovan Mitchell thing. They clearly decided that draft capital was their priority. They get a ton of picks in the Gobert trade. Now they get a ton of picks in the Mitchell trade. And overall, they've overhauled their roster in a really significant way with all these future picks and with flexible pieces and young guys and all these different things. Here's my issue, though. We've done this before, right, with the James Harden trade. I don't know who the young guy is that you're looking at and saying, this is the guy that we got for Donovan Mitchell. This is the guy that it turns out we could have gotten for Rudy Gobert, considering where his trade value was apparently at, at least uh, to Minnesota. There's no player on the roster. Like Colin Sexton's fine. Larry Markkinen's fine. Like Malik Beasley's fine. But all those guys are on the same level to me. None of them are on that, as we'll get to later. R.J. Barrett level of value to me personally. And so if, if you're Utah, like the picks are great. Like, congratulations. You moved off a ton of a, a ton of salary. And in the Gobert situation, that made complete sense. Like 100 out of 100 times you do the Gobert thing. But to me, like this is what you get for Donovan Mitchell. That's a big question mark for me. And I don't understand how this is the deal that they decided to go with. This is the best offer that they got. And at this point in the process, they still had time to wait this out a little bit longer and if this was at what I was going to get for Donovan Mitchell, I would have just waited. I would have waited till the trade deadline. I would have waited till next offseason. Whatever I would have needed to do, I think they could have gotten much, much more. Because again, to me, the players in this don't particularly matter unless you're a big Colin Saxon person, which I'm not. 
And so it's basically four unprotected picks and two two pick swaps for Donovan Mitchell, which, you know, it's an all-star caliber player. So like, that's a lot of value. But at the end of the day, I would have wanted more personally if I was Utah. And then we can't escape this Donovan Mitchell situation without talking about the Knicks, right? I don't understand how, basically how New York let it get to this point, right? So there's two sides to this coin. One is we got a report and a rumor the other day that said that the Knicks offered R.J. Barrett and two unprotected first in exchange for Donovan Mitchell. And to me, if I'm Utah and that offer is on the table, I know what I'd rather have. I'd rather have R.J. even on the new contract and he signed the contract and that made things complicated, whatever the case may be. Prior to that contract, if you're offering me RJ and two unprotected first, I'm not saying I would take that, but I am saying that I would rather have that over the Cleveland offer because I'd rather have the guy. I'd rather be able to point to RJ Barrett and say, this is the guy. I'd also rather have the Knicks picks. Like even with Donovan Mitchell, I don't know what the Knicks are going to be. Cleveland's going to be really good. All their guys are signed long-term. All their guys are on rookie contracts that matter or they're signed on an extension, including Donovan Mitchell. They have a big four of players that matter and that win you basketball games. The New York Knicks don't have that. And so if you get RJ Barrett in two first in exchange from New York, they basically have like, Mitchell, Brunson, Julius Randle, like that roster is worse. It just is. I would rather have those picks. I don't care about the swaps. The swaps aren't going to matter. It's three unprotected first. It's a first round guy they just drafted that might not matter from Cleveland. I would have rather had, if it was on the table, I would have had rather had the Knicks package of RJ Barrett and two firsts rather than what they got from Cleveland. Now, there's two sides to that. One, we don't know if New York actually offered that. And if they did offer that and Utah chose this Cleveland deal over the New York one, I don't understand that. But if they didn't offer that and it was like Quentin Grimes and three firsts, then I understand what Utah is doing here in terms of taking the Cleveland offer. But there's so many different sides to this. And, and, and what it comes down to to me is I don't know how New York let this one slip away. I don't know how they let Cleveland of all teams outbid them for Donovan Mitchell when Mitchell clearly wanted to go to New York and Cleveland didn't give up any of their main pieces. Like if you had told me that for whatever reason, Cleveland gave up Garland or Mobley or Allen or whatever the case may be, plus some picks, then I'd be like, okay, I, it's a good thing New York stayed away because it's it, it's just not worth that level of value. But Cleveland didn't have to do that, which hurts the pick compensation going back to Utah, and it makes them a really good team. I, I can't understand, unless they offered RJ into first, which maybe they did, I can't understand why Utah would take that offer and or I can't understand how New York would let themselves get outbid by Cleveland given what they were clearly prioritizing this offseason, which was getting draft capital for themselves to use in a deal exactly like this. They gave up a lottery pick this year to get future first round picks to use in a deal like this, and they'll still have an opportunity to down the road. But there's no way, in my opinion, you can let yourselves get outbid by a team that Donovan Mitchell didn't want to go to as much as he wanted to go to New York. Now, at the end of the day, with all those things said, all the trade breakdowns you can do, I think the thing to come away from with this is this is super exciting for Cleveland, like unbelievably exciting. I went from like, I felt like I was more pro Cleveland than most people out there in terms of the roster they were building, what they had put together than most people. And now I feel like everybody's going to kind of jump on that bandwagon, like what they needed apart from like a two-way wing that every team in the league seems to need. Apart from that, what they needed was they needed another creator. They needed offense alongside Darius Garland. As great as Darius Garland is, I love Darius Garland. He's an unbelievable all-star caliber guy. Just him running around out there, kicking it out to Isaac Okoro was not going to work. Like they needed more offensive firepower. And if that guy wasn't going to be Colin Sexton, which I don't think that's necessarily a winning formula for you, then they needed to bring in someone else. And like normally when these kinds of big trades happen, you have teams like Memphis and in this case, Cleveland and other teams thrown out there as like, hey, they could be an option. It would work really well if they would actually go there, but they never actually end up being traded there. But from a basketball perspective, this is a perfect situation for Donovan Mitchell. He doesn't have to be the only offensive guy like he's been for the most part for the entirety of his career in Utah. Him and Darius Garland can play alongside each other. They've got all the, the, the great defensive players and bigs behind them to make up for any kind of defensive inefficiencies. And the only thing Cleveland needs right now, in my opinion, to be like a conference finals team is a wing. Like now they're looking at like Isaac Okoro. And that's pretty much it because Abaji is the, a wing they drafted this year. He's gone. Uh, Markinen, they traded away. He's never really going to be like the 3 and D wing that they needed. But now it's like, hey, Isaac Okoro, can you maybe make like 35% of your spot up threes? Like that would be really nice. It's the only piece that they're missing in terms of their lineup. They have they still have Kevin Love coming off the bench. They still have other interesting guys coming off the bench for them. Now they're like, 
one or two trades away, I think, from being like a like a conference finals or maybe even a finals team with as young of a roster as they have as Mobley and Allen and Garland and Mitchell continue to grow and develop together. This is as good of a like 26, 27 and under group and core as we have in the league. When you consider that Mobley's a second year guy, Jared Allen is on a rookie extension, Darius Garland hasn't even hit his rookie extension yet, and Donovan Mitchell is signed long term as well. And I think that is such a critical part of all this, because if you're a Cleveland and you're going to bet on this, and I think it's the correct bet that you're going to give up these future picks, you're going to give up these unprotected assets, and more than likely they're going to be in the 20s. If you're going to bet that that's the case, you need to make sure that if something bad happens, it's injury related or some kind of weird performance thing. It's not guys leaving, guys being unhappy, guys being traded. Everybody signed for at least the next three years and in Mobley's case, even further out than that because of the, the restricted free agency rules. And that's an ideal situation to really put yourselves out there and say, hey, we're willing to give up these few, these three future protected picks because it doesn't matter what happens to those picks. We're going to be good. These guys are locked in long term. It's, it's a fantastic move for them. And if you're Utah, the only case for this is Colin Sexton's way better than everybody thinks that he is. Markinen is an actual asset. Abaji becomes something and these picks end up actually mattering because it's a real possibility that Utah just traded Donovan Mitchell for three picks in the 20s, two swaps that don't matter, Colin Sexton and Lowry Markin. That's not enough value in my opinion, or not even close to enough value in my opinion, considering what they could have gotten had they waited this process out a little bit more. And to me, that's just not a deal that you make in September. You have a couple of weeks still to make something else happen. And maybe the RJ Barrett extension really forced their hand. But to me, it's, it's a trade you can't make if you're Utah and if you're Cleveland. I can't wait to watch the Cavs play this season.